more privacy. I guess the first thing I ask everyone is to talk about the love affair with the movies and how it kind of began, how you got involved with foreign film, or whatever, yeah. Uh, my love affair with the movies started with my dad because he was really an avid moviegoer. I grew up in New York City and went with him to the movies all the time on weekends. And uh, that love affair started so long ago. He actually, it was more fun to go with him than to go shopping with my mother. Uh, I found shopping in New York, even in New York City, very boring. Uh, but the films I thought were fabulous. So I've always gone to the movies. And about five years ago, a friend invited me to go to an opening at the Paramount for the Seattle Film Festival. And I didn't know anything about it, um, being a relative newcomer in town. So I went, and I was dazzled and hooked immediately. Um, the, there was a party beforehand. And it seemed like, well, there were festive activities beforehand. You know, all people coming. And at that time, about five years ago, people were real dressed up. Uh, so there were lots of sequins and interesting creative costumes worn by people and all different types of personalities and I just loved it because I come from New York and love diversity and I saw it there at the film festival opening. So after the film festival I noticed that there were people there still helping at the party and and so I started chatting with one of them and I said do you need volunteers for next year's film festival? And she said, absolutely. She's real warm and uh, described the kinds of things to do. And I thought, this is it. I'll volunteer. And I'll get to see all sorts of films. I couldn't believe that volunteering, I'd not only see the films that were uh, on the screen for that evening, but I'd be able to uh, accumulate hours toward other films that I wanted to choose and select to see. So I said, this has got to be the greatest deal in town. And uh, I volunteered, and I've volunteered every year since then. And I've included friends, and I've brought them into it, and met friends at uh, the theaters, even if they weren't volunteering. And uh, it's very satisfying volunteering because I get to uh, show people how to use, how to look at the schedule, how to decide uh, upon the films that they might want to see, to direct them to the right theater, and how to get there in time if they've come to the wrong theater at the, even at the last minute. So there's some satisfaction in, especially in greeting the, the VIPs and the supporters of the film festival, uh, because they're all dressed up and excited to be there with their friends. And, and I think that su ongoing support is very important. So, um, that's how the love affair started. It hasn't ended. Um, other f love affairs have started and ended, but not with the film festival. <laughs> and um, actually, all of my friends, um, uh, whom I've had love affairs with, w thought the film festival was fabulous, and they continue to attend. And at each festival, at the openings and the closing parties, where I've also volunteered, and also at the theaters, uh, the friends are there, and I see the same core of people coming to the theaters. Uh, it's kind of nice to see people who you know share the same interests, and, and they have their own take and their own perspective on various films. Um, and I think that each year it's a new love affair because there are a wider array of films from different countries, and being Chinese American, I'm especially interested in seeing the films from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, from uh, China, um, the People's Republic of China, from Japan, from Australia, from that whole part of the world, which I love to visit and travel in. Uh, but I think that also on a yearly basis, there are new messages and new symbolism that come out of the films. And so I've, I've enjoyed seeing films like Judo and My Favorite Concubine, um, Picture Bride. Some of these are classical, traditional stories that bring to mind 
a lot of the history that I like to be in touch with, that I am not in touch with on a daily basis because I live in a predominantly Caucasian, Eurocentric culture. And so the film festival is a place where I get to see the contrasts and the messages coming out of those various countries and continents uh, west of here. Have you met any uh, VIPs when you're ushering? Or <laughs> Well, you know, um, I didn't, I don't consider that I've met people like Mel Gibson. I, I was um, volunteering at Braveheart at the opening for the film festival in 96, and Mel Gibson came right down the aisle. I had a chance to make my observations, but he didn't stop. He doesn't stop to chat with too many people. I think he was in a hurry to, to be seated and to see the film. But it was really exciting to see him there in support of the film festival. And um, he came down the aisle. And, and uh, my, my first reaction was that he was shorter than I thought. Uh, that's typical. And I thought, that's typical of these stars that look so huge on stage. But while watching Braveheart, it made me a little more sensitive to noticing uh, how they compensated for his height in various ways. And, and I thought very good camera work and good staging, good direction. It, it, it just is something that, a uh, little additional fact that, that I was intrigued with because it was a personal uh, reaction that I had. And it, it doesn't matter to me that he was shorter. I mean, he is, he's, uh, I think, he was brilliant on film and in his work uh, regarding Braveheart, and I thought he did a, uh, just a great job. So what does your uh, job usher entail, and what's the procedure? <laughs> you can see, I mean, I'm interested, so. Okay, uh, well, you know, you come early, and one of the first things to do is get a general sense of how it's going that day, what the crowd's going to be like, if there are wheelchairs expected, if there are perhaps um, a contingent coming in that doesn't speak the English language as their primary language. Um, I try to get a sense of who the sponsors are and how long the film is, um, where, if the upstairs balcony level at the Egyptian is gonna be open, if it's gonna be open later than it is then uh, immediately, you know, those general kinds of things because that people ask. Um, I'm pretty familiar with all the theaters now, so I know where the facilities are, where the telephones are, all of that. I can give people a sense of timing because often they depend upon um, the volunteers who stand there to, to tell them whether or not they can dash out or not and for how long. And, um, help people find their partners and friends. Very often they're looking for people and someone has left information with me and, and so there's assistance possible. And there are the VIP rows often to save, um, also for the media that come. And, and just to see that it's generally running smoothly, uh, check in with the other volunteers to make sure all of our bases are covered and the doors are covered. And, and that people are safe, and in the Egyptian there is there can be a real problem with uh, cool, fresh air. So people get overheated, and we try to reassure people that we'll leave the doors open till the last minute. And sometimes the windows get open on the balcony level, and and so I've been the lead usher uh, during a couple of those years, and and it's quite a bit of work actually to make sure that everything is happening on a timely basis, especially if there are people coming to speak or if there's a Q&A session after the film. And, and sometimes people generally are perhaps a little dazed by a few things, their own lives, or they've just come out of three other films that they've seen and, and they need to know um, generally what's happening as well so that we can get everyone seated on time and then get it cleaned out uh, in time for the pass holders to come in and take their seats. So. Have you found any interesting garbage, or was it, is everything typically candy wrappers? And well, it's typically uh, typically the usual stuff. Uh, lots of half-drunk sodas and 
things, but often people leave behind things that we know that they need. There are jackets. If it's the end of the day, we know that, you know, jackets and umbrellas and even shoes and sometimes jewelry is lost, you know, necklaces break and flashlights have to be found. And it's, it's, a, it's a busy time. There's always something happening at the film festival. So all of that goes on in the midst of trying to uh, provide a, a non-distracting environment for the speakers. What's the most unusual item you found? Have you found anything really unusual you didn't expect to find? No, I don't think so. I don't think I'm surprised by very much at this stage. <laughs> so. With all the volunteering that you do, do you ever get a chance to see any movies? Or someone said you just see half movies. Oh, my goodness. As hard as I'm working, I think, well, I always um, try to station myself at the main doors uh, not the external exterior doors, but the main entryway to the seats. And so, for example, uh, I'm always at those doors where I can see the stage at all times. So I hear the speakers and I see this, the film from the beginning because I'm there to ensure that latecomers are seated and we, we know where the seats are, single and double seats. So we guide them there by flashlight. And if it's very busy, then sometimes uh, busy seating people after the movie starts, but that usually ends in five minutes, five or ten minutes at the most if it's a real jammed session. But I get to see it from the start. I try not to sell t-shirts, and <laughs> so that's tough to find good volunteers who will sit out in the lobby throughout the whole film selling t-shirts. So have you ever done a secret film festival? I know we can't mention titles, but have you ever done that, or is that something that you just know about? I know about it, and I've seen some of the films, um, and uh, as, as a volunteer, I guess I feel uh, pretty free. If I've talked with the lead usher and I know that, that everything's very much under control, for example, at the Egyptian, I can come over here across to the Broadway Performance Hall if I'm not as interested in the film that's going on at the Egyptian, or vice versa. I've, I volunteered at every theater at the film festival. Often we volunteer in advance for the theater, and I found over time that I like what's shown at the Egyptian. Uh, I like the size of the screen, um, and I do miss some of the ones at the outlying theaters, although I have an opportunity sometimes to see those later on using my comp tickets or buying a ticket of my own. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think those things I take in stride. I, I don't get terribly excited because I think that the projectionists are good and they know just what to do. They may take a little bit of time and, and I sit usually and listen to the audience jeering or clapping, whatever, and, and I just uh, meditate and think about other things. Yeah, because there isn't much we can tell people. There isn't anything. And I, I think that that's up to the staff to let people know what's happening. So I typically don't tend to get riled or upset. You know, I think those things happen. It's just life. I guess one final thing, getting back to your love affair with movies, are there any, <laughs> what's the earliest images that you remember from, from cinema with your father, or are there, is that too far back? Or? Pretty far back. I remember that he enjoyed a variety of films and I think I've probably seen every James Bond film. Uh, he enjoyed, uh, my mother would enjoy things with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, so we saw that whole um, slew of films. And I just continued to go to see the films, the adventure films, uh, but my favorite are the foreign films. My f and we didn't see, when I was a kid, we didn't see many foreign films. So those were, that was a new love affair. That was a new, uh, I guess that was a breakthrough to see that there were films from all those other countries available at film festivals. So something I've wanted to do is go to Sundance and go to New York or 
San Francisco and go to the other film festivals, but uh, but that's a little bit it's a little bit difficult to think about taking a week's vacation to see films uh, at those other places. I think I'd be tempted to to see the town and to see other things. Do you remember the first foreign film you've seen, or is that there any guess at what, what you may have seen, like some Bergman movie? Or? Probably, probably because when I was in college. It was the Bergman films that were all the rage, and those are probably some of the some of the early films that I saw, the foreign films. Do you, before that, do you remember any yourself? I think I started at the Neptune, and I, I saw the Kurosawa ah. films. Like yes. Every Thursday. Yeah. Every Thursday for like ten weeks. Of yeah. Project Stark, and that was like up to ten years ago. I remember seeing the film about the husband and wife going through the forest and the bandit that attacks and the three, the Kurosawa film, and the film shown from their, each of their three perspectives, that one just, that one stands out in my mind. Rashomon. Rashomon, yeah. fabulous. I remember the Kurosawa films grabbed me, the black and whites, and I still enjoy Ron and, and all the others that he made later. Uh, fabulous filmmaker, I thought. I'm going to snap a picture. What did you say? <laughs> Still rolling? Yeah, I'll just let it go. One, two, smiles. Okay, that's cool. Take a picture. I'll just put it down there. So I wanted to also mention uh, something that was most memorable for me this past year was Peter Greenaway's talk with the audience, and I think it was at the Egyptian. And he spoke before we saw Pillow Book, which I thought was terrific because. He, I think he spoke before or afterwards, and of course, and um, he mentioned all the languages, the 20 plus languages that you could hear in that film and talked about the making of it. Uh, I thought it was one of the, the best films that I saw. I told everyone about it, and there were people I spoke to about it who went to see it and said that they didn't understand it. And I thought that I had indicated to them that it wasn't a narrative, wasn't a straightforward story, uh, that it was simply about this character and her, and her enjoyment of the writing of the characters on the flesh. And uh, I, thought it, I thought he did a wonderful job with the way he used the camera and the fact, and I did fully understand what he meant by when he said that that he wasn't interested in taking a novel and just portraying the pages page after page on film that he wanted to use the film more naturally as its own medium and I think he did that I think I thought that the uh, the cinematography was excellent and all around that film was was one of my all-time favorites. So I wanted to get, say Greenaway did a good job on that. I still haven't seen that. I have to go see it. I loved it. Loved it. The film festival has uh, has given me many opportunities. Some some of the opportunities were to see films that I wouldn't select. So I think chance uh, is just a, a fine part of one strategy, just to incorporate chance into the whole thing. And, and of course, I go through the catalog and the schedule like everyone else does and, and choose films. Often I choose films that have gotten prizes and awards at other locations. And that seems to be a, a, good, a good way to see some pretty excellent work. Anything else in the opinion you notes that you want to refer to mention? That's about it. Okay, I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. It's been fun. Look forward to many more film festivals. Give up things like that when you've got 
you know, when you've got a four, four year old who just destroys things, a dog who destroys things, and an 82 year old who behaves like a two year old destroying things. I mean, you just have to give up kind of wanting an attachment to anything because they'll, the minute you like something, they will destroy it. It just goes with the territory. I guess the first but, thing I ask people, Linda, is talk about your love affair of the movies. When did it start? You know, how did you get involved mm -hmm. in foreign film? Hmm. That sounds, sounds easy, but it's kind of complicated because, I mean, I'm 51, so I have a lot of decades to go through, and there are decades that I've entirely missed out on the movies, mostly because I was doing theater, and when you do theater, you sort of notoriously don't get to see anything. But, I mean, I, when I grew up, I grew up in a small town in Montana, well, Missoula, which was really small back in the 50s, and didn't have TV. So I got to see the first run of Davy Crockett and, and all of those kinds of Walt Disney films. And it was, literally was the Saturday matinee with the kids, you know, every child in, Mon in Missoula showing up to see the movies and playing Davy Crockett and having our little coonskin caps and the whole routine. And that was in Montana when I moved to Seattle. I think we maybe saw one movie a year and it was always an epic. It was something that we got through my dad's work. I mean, I'm a blue collar, my dad was a, a meat cutter, so I'm a blue collar kid and not a great deal in, the, in terms of culture from the family basis. I mean, I grew up with cowboy music, not even country western music, I mean cowboy music, I mean Lone Prairie kind of stuff. And I thought that Spaghetti was Franco-American, and I thought that Velveeta was cheese. I mean, I didn't know you could cook your own spaghetti and the cheese came in blocks and other flavors. So movies were not something I really knew about as a kid, except to go to the Walt Disney things, and we'd do once a year epic, you know, Ben-Hur, because Dad, through work, got tickets, and the entire Safeway store chain went to see Ben-Hur, and we would go do that. Um, when did I, I think I didn't really, figure out about movies until, for some reason, I don't know, the first foreign film I ever remember seeing was Knights of Kiberia. I don't know why I went. It was the very first subtitled film I ever saw, and it was slow, and I was bored, and I hated it, but I kept going back. I mean, I kept going back to see them, and pretty soon they were kind of, oh, yeah, you could read, and it wasn't a big deal. The first film I remember being, I don't know why this memory sticks in my mind, but it does. Didn't see a lot of movies through high school, but in college, my theater teacher was having a big dinner, and somewhere in the middle of dinner, before it was even finished, he looked at his watch. This, mind you, is in Walla Walla, Washington. There's not a lot of cultural opportunities in Walla Walla, but there was a film society that had movies every now and then. And he jumped up and said, we're going to be late for the movie. Nobody told me we were going to a movie and asked him what the movie was, and it was um, Children of Paradise. And for some reason, the title made me think it was going to be a Marlon Brando motorcycle movie. I don't know why I thought that, but that's what it implied to me. And we took off, and I fell in love with Children of Paradise. I mean, it combined theater, it combined movies, it combined everything, and, I, and that was it. That was the movie that started turning me on to going to see movies, to want to see movies. And I didn't see a whole lot. I mean, like I say, walla walla, your choices are limited. But then I went to New York City for a year to do Good Deeds, Good Deeds in the Ghetto, Vista Volunteer. And that was, it was the second year Vista existed. And I don't, I mean, now I think they have Vista positions and you apply for a position and you go. Then it was, this is your neighborhood. Find a problem and solve it. Okay, so here I am, kind of Montana, Seattle, small town kid, you know, all of a sudden in New York City, and started going to theater, and somebody at some point towards the end of my, my year there turned me on to the Thalia Theater, which was a repertory theater. Two movies, two movies a day, two different movies a day forever, and I think I spent the, my last month in New York in the Thalia Theater, and it was 1968, and I caught up on every foreign film that existed up to 1968. I mean, I did, you know, 
Boonwell and, and Bergman and Antonioni and everything. I mean, everything that had been made up to that point, I saw during that last month in New York. And I mean, that was it. I mean, I was, I was hooked on movies forever. Boonwell became my instant favorite. There are movies from that period, Nazarene, I think is my, you know, that are on my all time top 10 lists. Nobody ever sees Boonwell's Nazarene. It's brilliant, it's wonderful, I love it. Um, came back to Seattle and had, I was gonna be a teacher, I somehow didn't get work. I think it was because I said, oh, well, I've just come from Poverty Projects and I wanna go work at Franklin and Garfield and you know, work in the ghettos. And that apparently wasn't the thing you were supposed to say in 1969 to get employed. So I didn't get a job but I was working at the post office, which was actually right, because every self-respecting hippie at the time had to work in the post office. I mean, you had to, that was what you did. And during that period of time, I took a film course. That was sort of interesting. I, <laughs> I took a film course and got in trouble with the FBI. Probably the only person this ha happened to. I was, it was a summer, a summer film course, you know, run by the parks department. I mean, 16 millimeter cameras, we each did an eight millimeter little film. And then we moved on to 16 millimeter, and our teacher was getting you know scrap ends from TV newsreel, TV news stations and things, and putting them together. And he finally got enough film to shoot a 16 millimeter film, you know, a little 10 minute one. And you know, who had a story script? Well, nobody was. Nobody had a real story script except from New York. I had. Um, I had read about some street theater, some anti-war street theater things that were being done, and I'd not seen them, but I thought that would be a really great thing to film. It was just a little street theater where you had three people dressed up in your little, you know, Vietnam suits and three people in your little, your little army uniforms, and, and how did it go? I don't remember exactly, but the soldiers are given the order to go out and bomb the village. So they go out and they bomb the village. And then they're given the order to go out and hunt for all of the survivors. So they go hunt for all the survivors. And then they are given the order to shoot the survivors. And so you have three people lined up and we had a water pistol with red dye in it. And the soldiers go down the line. And this was when there was the famous life photo of General No with the gun in the head. And shoot one, shoot the second, and then you take the gun and you give it to somebody in the crowd that's gathered to shoot the third. And no matter what the reaction is, it, it's theater because they either, you know, withdraw and don't want anything to do with it. They sort of get a grin on their face and take the gun and shoot. And either way, it's kind of a horrifying confrontation. And so we agreed to, he agreed to accept that as our script. We decided to do it at the Seattle Center. I thought the, there's a big, pillar at the old Coliseum that was a great, that would be a very good setting for it. And took my crew out one Sunday. My mom had packed tuna fish sandwiches for everybody and we had a dog. It was my mom, my dad, the dog, all the equipment, my little cast. And we wanted to do a run through, a, a little dry run through of it. So we got in costume and I had people got people all set up and the Seattle Center security drove by and saw these people looking kind of political and got really upset and stopped the process, hauled me off. It took me an hour to, ne to negotiate with the Seattle Center management that no, I was not gonna cause a riot. No, I was, I was making a film. I was not doing a political thing. It was just a film. It was a script. We weren't even filming in sequence, damn it. And so they finally agreed to do it. I think I had to sign something that said I would be personally responsible for any riots which incurred due to the filming of this, but we finally got to do it. And after the fact, I found out that my mother had been, <laughs> my, poor, my poor teacher was totally upset because my mother was ready to march in and demand that they release her daughter and let her get on with her business. My mother, who has no political leanings whatsoever, was just upset that they were not letting me do what I wanted to do. But we filmed it. We took it to be processed at somebody who is still one of the major cinema labs who will remain nameless, but we went back to pick it up. Actually, my teacher went back to pick it up and he came back to the car sort of absolutely white in the face and I said, where's my film? He said, the FBI has it. Said, what do you mean the FBI has it? They wanted to see it first, we can come back tomorrow. 
oh, okay. And so the next day we went back and by that time the, the clerk lady must have been told she's not supposed to say that sort of thing because she said, oh yeah, it's here. Well, where was it yesterday? Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay. And the story, as I understand it, was that the man who was timing it when they were printing it was an ex-army officer who got upset at the images that he was being, that he was seeing and called the FBI and said, you should probably come take a look at this before we release it out. So they kept it for a day. My poor teacher will probably never, probably never took an easy summer course again. I mean, I think this was 1969 and I, he probably thought his film career was over being somehow involved with this radical political peace movement thing and we were just making a film. That was all I was trying to do. But that was, it. I got the film together and it was, you know, it was five minutes and it was real choppy because I couldn't hold a lot of the shots long enough. But I learned enough about making film and how to do the process that now I know a little bit about camera work, when I, so when I see movies I can tell some, tell a little bit about what's going on. The th One of the things is though I actually know amazingly little about what the film process is because I come from theater, I mean theater is what I do and what I love and what my background is and it's real kinetic and there's a part of movie making that a part of movie viewing that I don't want to ruin by knowing too much about it. I mean I want to have an emotional experience and I don't want to violate that by knowing that this was the camera angle and this was the shot and this was the technique. So I think I sort of intentionally stopped pursuing making films at that point just because I wanted I wanted to keep the magic there for it for me. I mean it has to be a really obvious mistake for me to pick up on it. You know, the ice cream is there one scene and the ice cream is gone the next scene. I mean, if it's that obvious, I might see it. Otherwise, I'm not going to pick up on all those little reverse shots or camera booms if they're little ones. And, and a part of that is absolutely, totally intentional. I want the emotional experience. I don't want to know too much. It's like I'm very glad I learned about poetry when I was in high school and we ruined things like I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree because who wants to but I don't want to ruin a movie to have to learn all of that because you kind of do when you when you actually get all of that down. So I stopped, act, I stopped learning about the making of films but I kept going and I went to San Francisco and started doing theater so I, I lost out on the 70s in movies because like I say when you do theater you're rehearsing or you're performing and there's just not any time left over. I saw a lot if there was something Boonwell did I, I would go see that compulsively and, and go to see those movies but kind of missed out. Came back to Seattle and didn't start, I started the film festival in 84 and I remember when I first came back to Seattle, I was here for about four years and I did a little bit of theater, but not a lot. And my theater partner left and I sulked for a long time and finally decided, okay, we're going to have to give up theater and think other things. And I took a trip and I was gone for 30, 30 days and went to China and Japan. And I came back to Seattle and I really wasn't ready to rejoin reality. I mean, I just really wasn't ready to be here. And I opened up the paper and it was film festival. Oh, okay. And so I kind of went straight from the airplane to the film festival. And it was absolute escape it was, I'm not back yet. I'm somewhere else again. So all the Chinese films, all the Asian films, um, and saw all these people sitting around who were people who by 1984 had already been going for a million years. And went back the next year and went back the next year and by about the fourth year I realized I'd spent so much money on buying my little six pack of tickets it was obviously time to get a, a, a pass and got a pass and started going really regularly and in a lot of ways the film festival has been 
it's kind of an anchor. I mean, the film, for some reason, the film festival, May, June, May, June have turned out to be disastrous months in my life as a general rule. I mean, one, one film festival, opening, opening night was Thursday, Friday morning, I woke up all ready to start the movies, and my dad, I was, my dad was living with me and I was caretaking him and setting out his pills and everything. And it was noontime and he had taken all of his pills by noontime that he should take throughout the day. I mean, he had taken all of them on a million different heart meds, rushed him off to the hospital. Yes, he almost died. He suddenly is in the hospital. It's like, dad is in the hospital and I have to be at a movie in 10 minutes. I can do this. And I spent the next two weeks going between visiting my dad in the hospital, going to a film, running home, feeding the dog, going to see my dad in the hospital, dashing back to another movie. And I think in some ways it sort of, it made the whole hospital experience kind of okay because there was, I had such intense focus on getting to movies. It didn't occur to me to not go to the movies. I mean, it just didn't cross my mind that I could give up a movie. Um, but it was this triangle between here and Highline Hospital and my house and downtown and, and you know, this little triangle act of activity I did for the two weeks he was in the hospital. And then I finally got to see a few films in peace. And then of course I'm still trying to work because I couldn't, I can't take all of that time off work and it's a graveyard shift. So, so sort of see a movie, dash off to work, half dead try to get through work and of course I come bumping into work saying I saw this great movie and there's this and this and this and, and you will need well well where's the chime oh well you have um it's not showing anymore uh you'll never get to see it I'm sorry and I finally started stop telling people about movies because there are these wonderful things that nobody is ever ever going to be able to see except I still like I come bumping off and there's all this enthusiasm gets me through the night go home sleep a few hours go to the hospital go to the movies and, and that year was kind of chaotic. A couple of years later, a friend of mine, my brother's best friend, who was sort of my little brother by circumstance, came home from the hospital to die. He had AIDS. And all through the film festival, it was making the phone calls of trying to get the airplane tickets arranged and, and talking to John as much as I could on the phone. He was kind of in and out of focus and my brother left on Monday to go see him and I was going to a movie and talking on the phone and arranging everything and talking to everybody and going to another movie and doing all of this and John actually died before I was going to leave on Thursday and he died Wednesday night. But the film festival sort of sustained me through that also just seeing movies, I mean kind of having that split focus of yes there's this horrible life thing going on and then there are and then there are films and i always pick the depressing films and people always say what are you doing with all these depressing films isn't your life depressing enough and it's i think in some ways it's kind of i go to depressing films because i want to make sure there's still some emotion left i want to make sure that i've still got some feeling because all of these things keep happening. I mean, I did theater in San Francisco for 10 years and I was doing off-off Broadway theater. And it was a big gay community and probably 80% of all of the people who are my friends and I worked with are dead. And that whole grieving process, you know, has taken years and years to get over. It, it's very strange to have an entire decade of your life sort of wiped out. I mean, we know what we did in a certain period of time because you've got people to share it with or you've got people who have the same memories that you do. And I don't have anybody who has my memories anymore. They're all gone. And, and sometimes in coping, you kind of shut down and go very, very dead. And I think I go to see the films, I choose the films I go to see to make sure that there's still some kind of life there, to make sure there's an emotional experience there. I mean, if I see a comedy, that's fine. I can, I can live with a comedy every now and then, but I really do choose depressing, horrible movies on, on the overall, overall basis. And then a couple of years ago, well, for the last two years, I guess, for the film festival, my dad 
has Alzheimer's and it got progressively worse and so I was having to have a caretaker be with him during my film festival hours. So I would come home and my poor caretaker would be tearing out her hair because dad at the first time, the first year I had a caretaker, dad was in his very sort of manic, he, he was really manic. And I mean, I'd come home and he would have taken all of the drawers out of all of the dressers and moved everything around and didn't want to go to sleep and was wandering around the neighborhood. And my caretaker is kind of following behind him. And so I'd get home from movies and be all excited and then have to sit and calm dad down and get him to bed and do the whole morning thing and get him fed and get everything organized and then take off for the movies again at noon because we had started doing press passes at, or being able to go to the press screenings at that point. And that was for two years. The last year my dad wasn't here, but after my dad left, I inherited my dog who turned out to be diabetic. So I was, yay, hooray, I don't have to give you know, I don't have to be home at certain hours to give medications to anybody anymore. Wrong. I have to be home twice a day to give the dog her insulin shots. So during the film festival this year, the dog got boarded at the vet part-time, was with my brother part-time, and then I was there part-time. And so there was this still, this continual chaos and confusion of getting my life organized and trying to work. But again, it has never dawned on me not to go to the film festival. I mean, you see movies. I mean, that's what you do. You see movies. It's not an option not to see movies. And for a couple of years, one of the film festival people who goes was a co-worker. We, we both work at King County Jail. So we sort of work in a movie setting. And Graveyard, we both work weekend graveyards, which is, of course, the most exciting time because you get all the drunks and the druggies and, and amazing stories. And it was nice when he was working the same shift I was because we could at least talk about movies together. Um, somebody was there who understood. Everybody else just thinks I'm crazed. I mean, every, I, anybody who's a film festival pass holder has a, an entire family that looks at you like, I can't believe you're doing this. Again? Again. <laughs> I mean, every day, even when my dad was, was healthy, it was, you're going to the movies again tonight? Yeah. What about tomorrow night? Yeah, I'm going again tomorrow night. And I would try on the calendar, put big yellow lines, all of these days I'm going to be at the film festival. And in spite of the fact that every day I would point that out, we're only here, he would, every night, you're going again? Yeah, I'm going again. And yeah, family does not get it. They simply do not get it. My brother and sister-in-law think I'm out of my mind. And Compared to some film pass holders, I don't even, I mean, my personal best is 77, which isn't really a major amount compared to what a lot of people see. On bad years, I only get to about 50, but, um, but not going is not an option. I mean, it's like I say, it's just not an option. And for several years, I had my motorcycle, and that was really easy. And one, one night, my motorcycle died, deserted me on Capitol Hill at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm going, oh dead motorcycle. It's going to have to stay here for the duration of the film festival. Too bad. <laughs> you know, take the bus home, get home at, you know, three o'clock, get back up at eight so I can go to a movie. <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, movies, I don't see a whole lot of films during the year. I think because in part I'm, I'm kind of burning out. Well, that's not right. I used to do things like gardening. I used to do things like camping. Well, caretaking dad kind of screwed those things up, but he also used to do all of the gardening for me. I mean, I would set stuff out and he would do it. And he would take care of a whole lot. Well, now, by the time the film festival happens, exactly when you should be planting your tomatoes and cucumbers, you know? So that's not getting done anymore. And every time the film festival is over, I have a sudden impulse to go put things in the ground. Well, it's too late. I put them in the ground. They die, but I still have not learned that yet. I'm still compulsively putting things in the ground. And it takes a couple of weeks to recover. And then you start going camping. So you kind of miss out on all of the summer films. And I don't really pick up on movies again until about September, by which time all the theater tickets. I mean, September and October, there's a million and one dance companies and theater productions. And 
So they tend to use up that. So dead of winter is when I pick up then on all the movies I've missed through the summer and, and the rest of the months. Thankfully, not much opens in the summer that I care about. But um, then during the winter, I have a little spasm of catching up on all of the movies, the leftover movies. And it comes the film festival again. You start anticipating the film festival, you know, like around March, trying to figure out what days can I miss at work and how am I going to make this happen and how little sleep can I actually live on and go through that process. But I can't imagine life without going to movies. I periodically think I really, I need to write, I need to go live in the mountains, I need to go live at the ocean, I need a nice quiet environment and all of that would be wonderful, but I wouldn't be able to go to the movies. I mean, I can't quite imagine what that would be like. So, so it crosses my mind this would be a good thing, but I don't ever do it. And I periodically think, okay, so I go to all these movies, I do theater, I should, if I want to write, which I do, I should write movies and play scripts. And I actually tried it. I took some classes and went to it, and I, I don't want to write about it. I mean, I don't want to write scripts. I want those things to be emotional, wonderful things. I don't want to play in it as a, as a um, maker of them. I just want the pure gut emotional experience of it all. And, and I'm happy with that. I mean, my, my acting is, is very emotional. I mean, I use, how to say, I think when you're doing a craft, you learn the craft first and you get very, very good at the craft. And then if, if you, if it's what you should be doing, suddenly there is an art that happens just because that's what you really should be doing. You have the timing for it. You have the sense of it. You know how it should work and you just do it, but you have to have the craft first. Well, I'm not willing to sit down and learn the craft of, of filmmaking because I don't, like I say, I don't want to ruin it. I want the emotional experience. And I know the craft would probably be pretty easy. Well, easy. I mean, crafts are never easy. They take a lot of practice. You have to learn a whole lot of things and make a whole lot of mistakes. But, but I mean, I know how that works. I know it can be done. I don't want to learn the craft of writing for this. I don't want to learn how to structure scenes. I'm, I'm the real good doctor for, for scripts that aren't working, for plays that aren't quite right. I mean, I can look at something and say, oh, this is where you're missing. This is what needs to happen. But I don't want to sit down and be the one who structures it and sets it up. I've done some directing. I know how that works. I'd still rather be at the other end. Because as a director, you're busy moving little objects around and you kind of forget about the emotional part, which is what I like. So, uh, and the thing about going to foreign films as opposed to American films, I'm continually amazed at how much I sort of, especially, I mean, working in the jail, this sounds really weird, but I, I interview people, see if they can go home for free or if they have to post bail or make a recommendation to the judge about why they should never get out or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and we get more and more of an international population as the years go on, particularly here. And it amazes me how sometimes I can be talking to people from Eastern Europe or Romanians. Romanians are big. I don't know why. Suddenly Romanians are in Seattle and getting arrested. But there's, you know, it's like, they're not foreign to me because I've seen them in the movies. I've, I've listened to the culture. I know the sound of the language. I have a sense of why they did what they did or not. It's not it's the ambience. I think that's the word I want. I have a sense of the ambience of their lives. And so it doesn't seem so strange to me calling households with lots of different people trying in, to interpret on the telephone or or having my, my, the person I'm interviewing, you know, wave their hands or do something that's a real national characteristic that you wouldn't know if I hadn't sort of grown used to this in the, in the movies, if I hadn't seen it in the film, or things that 
you read about that I say, oh yeah, well they always shut the water off during such and such a time and such and such a time in this country. Things that don't, you know, it doesn't occur to anybody that that kind of thing happens and it, it makes perfect sense when people are explaining this to me or when they say, well I couldn't do it then because, oh yeah, right. And there's this whole world of, of there's this whole other world that I know about, that I've experienced, that's kind of a part of me just because I've seen it in the movies over and over and over again. Countries I've never even heard of that every now and then they show up. I mean, the name shows up or somebody says, oh yeah, I, I've got relatives in Burkina Faso. You what? <laughs> Who's ever heard of that? But it, it really broadens the world in a way that it that wouldn't happen if you were stuck with American films or if you didn't go to movies at all. The sounds of languages, just having an ear that tunes into different sounds makes a difference. I'm not really good at languages, but I know the sounds of, of things and it's not as foreign, as peculiar to me as it is to a lot of people. And I speak minimal Spanish, so a lot of times they save Spanish-speaking people for me to talk to and it just Sometimes it just amuses me no end because I'll go out to speak to some, somebody in Spanish and they don't speak Spanish, they speak Czechoslovakian. <laughs> you couldn't tell the difference between Czechoslovakian and Spanish, you fools? I mean, what is this? But that, you know, it makes a difference. It broadens your life and everything that you do. And do you remember any film festival incidents, like, you know, missing reels or films that never show up? Oh, there are always those. Yeah, or any <laughs> one, of my favorite, one of my favorite films that I think all of three of us saw, I mean, favorite horrible films. It was just, it was one of those late night ones at the, at the Broadway theater. And... It was Lord of the Flies, I believe, was the title of it. And it was just, it was this, it was, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. Lord of the Flies was this man, it was a, a Russian film, somewhere in Russia. This man whose, whose theory was he could get rid of flies by killing off maggots. And so he was growing maggots. He was finding dead animals and he had this huge yard in which he had open dead animals in which dead maggots were growing and then he was drowning the maggots <laughs> it was just gross and there were maybe 25 people in the audience and we all sat there just squirming in our chairs making faces going oh uh, yeah and loving every minute of it i mean it was just sick enough it was just horrible enough that it was terribly funny and we all came out of there, you know, as, as one. We have all experienced this amazing film that nobody else will ever see, and we're gonna all put it at the top of our most favorite list, and nobody will ever know what it is. <laughs> and it's true, when, when Rox a couple of years ago made that list, Lord of the Flies came up there as one of the, the um, favorites that nobody ever saw. And nobody will ever know what that movie's really about, except the 25 of us who saw, maybe three of us were pass holders. And I, I loved that. I mean, that was just one of my favorite moments. And sitting with people. I like going to films where you're maybe the only pass holder and everybody else is Iranian or something else. You know, you just pick the wrong movie and you look around you and you're really in foreign, you're really in a foreign country when you see the film. I mean, you could be in Tehran watching this movie with other people. I mean, those are, are always most exciting. And I like how we all have our favorite seats. Oh, and you know, you have to rush in and it's, I mean, you know, you know in the ultimate scheme of things, you can see from any seat in the theater mostly. I mean, it's not going to ruin your life if you're sitting on the left side as opposed to the right side. But at the same time, when I'm at the Egyptian, I want this seat here. <laughs> and so the whole scramble to get to your favorite seat. And every now and then I experiment with things. I say, okay, intentionally, I will not sit in my seat this time to see how it works. Well, it kind of works, but it's not satisfying. It's not the same experience if you're not in your right seat. So I, I always thoroughly, 
thoroughly enjoy the little the process we go through. And you, you learn how to stand in line and scan who's in front of you. Okay, they sit over there, they sit over there, they sit over there, so I don't have to worry about them. Ah, that person I have to worry about. She usually goes with her friend. Well, if her friend is there first, they've saved the seat next to them. Hmm, I might have to go for option number two. Let me see, who else is in line? And you scan and you figure it out. Try to figure out where you're going to end up. But that can take a lot of energy and effort, you know, doing that sort of thing, most important. And... You signed your thing, um, AKA Lolly Madonna. Could you explain that? <laughs> ah, Lolly Madonna. Yes, Lolly Madonna was um, a name given to me in San Francisco after, at a late night drunken theater party, um, somebody decided this was about the time that the Beatles' Lady Madonna was, was out, and somebody dubbed me Lolly Madonna. Well, Lolly Madonna then became a persona all on her own. Lolly Madonna is a blonde. She tends to wear pink and purple pinafores. And Lolly Madonna became a San Francisco creation who would MC benefits and things. And she was an entirely invented character who was just simply given to me accidentally. And Lolly Madonna every now and then did a theater piece that I didn't want anybody else to know about, which for me was just opposite because I was doing experimental theater and those things I was willing to be a part of. When I went out to Mill Valley to do summer pageants, that's when Lolly Madonna went because I don't want anybody to know I do straight summer pageants out of Mount Tamalpais. And so Lolly has done, Lolly did theater in San Francisco and Lolly Madonna, we were always going to have a number of different groups, you know, Lolly and the Madonnas could be a singing group. Um, she, there are a lot of Lindas in the world. I mean, 50s was a, 40s and 50s named a lot of Lindas. So Lolly's, Lolly's the continual alter ego who every now and then sort of pops up and does her own little thing. She, she she's a blonde. Lolly is definitely a blonde. I mean, I've tried to make her a brunette, but no. Without the blonde wig, it's just not the same. And she was a creation. I think one of the things of working with a lot of gay men in theater is they sort of use you as their alter ego. And so Lolly was in part created by a whole lot of gay men who did not do drag, but who kind of needed an alter ego to do drag for them. And, and that was me. I, I did that kind of unconsciously, but I did, I realized after the fact that that precisely what I, was what I was doing. I was their alter ego. I was being their drag for them. And that's kind of nice, and it's nice to have another personality. I mean, everybody should have one. I think absolutely everybody should have an alternate personality. Anything else you want to share? Mm. <laughs> There are all, you know, there are all these things and I can't... That's okay. Do you remember any of the passwords? I think some passwords have passed away. I don't know if you've known any of those. Yeah, not, not really well. Um, but yeah, every year when you come back and you say, oh, yeah, so-and-so isn't here. And, and it is like a family. It is like a history. I mean, we have our film festival baby. So, I mean, you are... I, I don't think I heard the story, but one of the, I think someone said one of the past orders had a baby or something during a festival. Mm -hmm. Diane. Yeah. You know, Diane, who has the short hair yeah. and the... Well, she, she was very pregnant during, what, let's see, her daughter must be four, four this year maybe, or five. She was very pregnant during one of the film festivals, and she said, I'm going to get through the film festival. And she almost made it. It was up to, like, the last week of the film festival. Seven o'clock movie, her water broke. And she said, I'm going to stay through the movie. Okay, she stayed through the movie. She says, I can make it through the nine o'clock movie. <laughs> and she, I'm not sure if she got all the way through the nine o'clock movie, but immediately after she went to the hospital and had her baby. <laughs> so it was become the film festival baby. She missed the last two days. She was rather annoyed. But when we had our party about a week or so later, she brought her, her little film festival baby, little tiny, little tiny thing in a little basket. And so, yes, we have our very own film festival baby, and we're very proud of her. She's definitely one of the 
she's going to grow up going to the movies. And there have been a few kids who've gone to the movies. A couple of years back, there was a couple who was bringing their son. And he, he was probably nine or ten at the time. And that kid was smart. I mean, that kid would watch political movies, and he would be able to sit there and talk about the politics of it with you. And I'm going, I don't know that much about Germany in the, that period of time. And he knew it. I mean, he was wonderful. And I guess he finally stopped coming simply because he got old enough to play soccer and to do all of that stuff. So he had school activities and didn't come to the films anymore. But when my sister-in-law got pregnant, I don't, I mean, children are okay, but they're not my favorite. I don't have any. I never wanted any. And it was okay. You can go have your baby. And my first, first thing I told her was, I'm very glad you're pregnant. I'm very glad you're going to have a baby. But when he's old enough to read subtitles, I'll come see him. And I'll become an aunt. But don't count on me until he can read subtitles. And I really literally thought it was going to work out that way. Turns out he was born with a whole lot of medical problems, so I ended up becoming an aunt far sooner than I anticipated because went into some, you know, had to do some, some home child care and all of that. But still, Jordan's a smart little kid, and I'm waiting for him to be able to read subtitles, and then he's going to be coming to the film festival <laughs> because I think he will enjoy it. I mean, it's the one thing I can share with him that, that is different from what everybody else has. He's got a grandmother who's going to spoil him rotten. And movies, I mean, I can share movies, and, and he'll be really wonderful at that. He's a, his physical problem, he was born with one dead kidney and one partially functioning kidney, and he had to be fed. I didn't know this, but kidneys affect your um, appetite. Yeah. So he grew up without having any appetite, without being able to eat. And so he's got a G-tube straight into his stomach, which reminds me, talk about, you know, films connecting. Let me get this thing stopped. Let me get another.